Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello, welcome virtually to Brooklyn Law School and to the Brooklyn Book Festival. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Simonson. I'm a professor at Brooklyn Law School and co-director of the Law School Center for Criminal Justice. Today, I'm so excited to have with us Professor Matthew Clare, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Stanford University, as well as my colleague, Professor Alexis Hoke, who's an assistant professor here at Brooklyn Law School. We're here to talk about Professor Clare's book, Privilege and Punishment, How Race and Class Matter in Criminal Court, and to have a conversation together about racial and class inequality in the criminal legal system, about the role of attorneys, and especially defense attorneys in that system, and about the potential for institutional change or even transformational change in how we address harm and wrongdoing. Before we dive in, I wanna say a few words about this event. First, please be aware that this program is being recorded and may be posted on the Brooklyn Law School YouTube channel for educational purposes. This program is also part of the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is happening all this week. We're honored to be a part of it. And if after this event, you want more legal themed Brooklyn Book Festival events, I recommend the program this Sunday at noon in the outdoor stage outside Brooklyn Law School, featuring Professor Wilfred Codrington speaking about his new book, The People's Constitution, as well as many other great festival events. Today's program is brought to you by the Center for Criminal Justice at Brooklyn Law School, which is our law school's locus of critical conversations, education, and sharing of expertise on topics in criminal law and policy. A big thank you to my co-directors of the center, professors Kate Mogulescu and Stacey Kaplow, as well as Dean Mike Cahill. And when it comes to making events like this happen, thanks especially to the Brooklyn Law School events crew, including Liz Alper and Chris Gibbons. So what I'm going to do is uh, introduce professors Claire and Hogue, um, then uh, say a little bit by way of introduction to this event, uh, and then we'll get to hear from Professor Claire about his book. Starting right now, if you have thoughts or questions, uh, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, uh, all three of us can see the questions and, and comments that you have, and we'll be sure to incorporate them in our discussion as we go forward. So don't wait to the end, uh, put them in now. So I'd like to introduce you to the other two people who you will see on your screens, and who I'm so excited to be in conversation with. I will start with Professor Claire, who, as I mentioned, is an assistant professor of sociology at Stanford University. Professor Claire's scholarship broadly examines how cultural meanings and interactions reflect, reproduce, and challenge various dimensions of social inequality. His research to date has focused on inequality in the criminal legal system and the legal profession, including, of course, privilege and punishment. And his research has also been published in a wide range of academic and popular outlets, and his work has received numerous awards. One academic publication I did want to mention, and that hopefully we can get to talking about, is an article forthcoming in the California Law Review about abolition in criminal court and possibilities there. Professor Clare, uh, for this book, Privilege and Punishment, uh, conducted extensive fieldwork in the Boston court system attended criminal hearings and interviewing and interviewed people accused of crimes, lawyers, judges, police officers, and probation officers. And based on that intensive research, he's written a book that uncovers how privilege and inequality play out in criminal court interactions, uh, which is what we'll talk about today. Also here for this conversation is Professor Alexis Hogue, who joined the Brooklyn Law faculty this year. She teaches and writes in criminal law and procedure, evidence and carceral abolition, and her own scholarship examines the ways in which policies, doctrines, and practices within the criminal legal system erode people's constitutional rights and perpetuate racial subordination. Her scholarship spans a wide variety of important topics, but of particular note to today's conversation is a piece that will be published in the New York University Law Review this year called Black on Black Representation, which is about the Sixth Amendment right to counsel with a focus in part 
on how black people accused of crimes can benefit from having black public defenders and from having culturally competent lawyers. And it's a perspective that's very relevant to the dynamics between people accused of crimes and their lawyers that Professor Claire talks about in his book. So I'm excited to talk about um, those interactions. Prior to joining academia, Professor Hogue spent more than a decade as a civil rights and criminal defense lawyer, primarily representing capitally convicted clients in federal post-conviction proceedings. So she's really an ideal person to bring into this conversation. And I'm so glad to have her here and to have her at the law school. As I mentioned, I'm Jocelyn Simonson, <clears throat> a professor at Brooklyn Law School and co-director of the Center for Criminal Justice. And among other things, I write and think about how collective change can be possible in the face of systems of mass incarceration and mass punishment that have such a firm grasp on our hearts and minds. And at the Center for Criminal Justice, one of the things we try to do is facilitate discussion and critical thinking about how the criminal legal system affects the people who are caught up in it from all different angles. Making sure that we're remembering that even as we speak or hold events like this, people are sitting in cages in jails and prisons. People are sitting in the courthouse down the street waiting to catch a glimpse of their loved ones. People are being stopped by police officers and placed in handcuffs. And people are being harmed in lots of different ways, are worried about how to stay safe and are asking how the state can help them stay safe. On my mind right now are the horrors of the jails in New York City, and in particular, the complex of jails on Rikers Island. As many of you likely know, more than 12 people have died in New York City custody in uh, 2021 so far. And by all accounts from people spending time there, Rikers Island is a place of violence and despair, something that has always been the case, but is true now more than ever and is being noticed perhaps um, as much as ever. Rikers Island can seem so far away, or perhaps if you're in another uh, place, Silicon Valley, for example, um, the jails and prisons that are actually nearby can, can seem really far away, uh, depending on your situation. Um, you know, in New York City, until a few years ago, Rikers Island wasn't even visible on MTA subway maps uh, as if it wasn't there. Um, but a lot of you here with us virtually today are law students or are current lawyers or uh, take part in the system of different ways or teach future lawyers and therefore are part of the system. And of course, lawyers who work within the criminal legal system are actually a part of how it is that people end up locked in cages uh, at places like Rikers Island. And so as far as ways it seems, hopefully we can today as we're talking make some of the connections between inequalities in courtrooms, relationships in courtrooms, institutional dynamics between lawyers and clients, and between our broader systems of punishment and things that are less visible and are harder to study. Uh, so that is what is on my mind. And with that last thought, I am going to turn it over to Professor Claire, who's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about this book before we jump into a conversation. Again, as you hear him talk, any thoughts or comments, put them in the q and um, Looking forward to hearing all of your reactions. Take it away, Professor Claire. Well, thanks so much, uh, Professor Simonson and, and also Professor Hogue for being in conversation with me today and for everyone at, at Brooklyn Law for organizing this conversation. Um, and thanks for those of you who are in attendance um, and will be part of the conversation as well through the Q&A feature. I also want to recognize uh, the Brooklyn Book Festival for even thinking to include uh, this as part of their, their uh, festival this year in their virtual program. Um, so I'm just going to take, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes or so um, for people who haven't um, had a chance to know anything at all about the book, uh, sort of why I wrote the book, um, and contextualizing in particular the problems of court punishment today, and sort of summarizing the book's main findings. And um, you know, I'll be eager uh, to have a conversation um, about sort of, you know, the findings of the book with, with the audience, but I think uh, sort of I want to really sort of lean on and, and extend sort of what uh, Professor Simonson mentioned about visibility. You know, I wrote this book uh, 
um, to understand and give voice to and hopefully help to improve the lives of people who experience being processed as a defendant in our nation's criminal courts. And while the courts are uh, sort of often thought of as a more visible feature of the system and certainly are, are supposedly more accessible than, than prisons and jails, you know, many of us don't actually go into courthouses or at least routinely observe courts. Um, and so I think unpacking and, and sort of shedding a light on what's happening in our courts in ways that might be surprising um, um, is really sort of a, a part of why I wrote this book. So just a little bit of background. So at the turn of the 20th century, America's criminal courts were notoriously arbitrary, racist, and corrupt. Um, in the South, Black citizens were excluded from serving on juries, and Black defendants were tortured for self-incriminating testimony. Mass arrests and mob-dominated trials were a routine feature of the courts, and they were documented uh, you know, among early sociologists at the time, like Du Bois and others. Um, but also they were sort of documented in everyday uh, reflections from lawyers um, at the time who were engaging um, with the system. Meanwhile, in the Northeast, the courts had their own problems. Uh, they often targeted working class European immigrants in addition to working class people of color. And so in the middle of the 20th century, the Supreme Court intervened, as uh, many of you in the audience know, in various ways. And in particular for the book, uh, the court extended Sixth Amendment protections to defendants um, through various Supreme Court decisions. And of course, in 1963, we had the Gideon decision, which expanded the affirmative right to an attorney in most criminal cases with the possibility of jail time. And from that decision and sort of the uh, symbolic sort of uh, statement from the Supreme Court that this uh, right to counsel mattered, um, a new wave of public defender's offices were established across the nation, and then also various forms of uh, providing indigent defense representation. So by no means do we have public defender's offices in every jurisdiction in the United States. Um, they're more common, for example, in the Northeast than they are in the South. Um, and there are other ways of providing indigent defense, which uh, many scholars have found to be less adequate than a public defender's office. And so despite these constitutional guarantees that we have, uh, researchers over the past 50 years kept documenting high plea rates and a lack of adversarialism in our courts. And at the same time, federal and local governments shifted resources from social service provision toward punitive legal control through policing and increasing the number of correctional officers and court officials. And so over this period, courts saw an increase in caseloads as well as continued racial disparities. So today, state courts process more than 17 million court cases every year. Um, so this isn't 17 million people necessarily. Uh, this is cases as you know, more than uh, some people can have more than one court case. Um, but this is a, a very high number of cases processed through the state courts every year. And although policing, um, court processing, and incarceration are often targeted at poor people of color in particular, especially Black and Latino men with low levels of education, more privileged groups have also been pulled into the courts because we've simply just had such a massive rise in our criminal court system over the past 40 years and 40 to 50 years. So while existing research on the court system within sociology and criminology and, and legal studies as well continues to provide important knowledge about the tools and logics of empowered legal authorities and what their perspectives are on this massive system, Recent research often overlooks the perspectives and experiences of people who are clients in the system or criminal defendants. And so the book asks, what is it like to be processed in criminal court today? And importantly, how does such processing vary by race and class? So for over three years, I conducted fieldwork and in interviews in Boston, where I intentionally sought to follow a racially and socioeconomically diverse group of defendants. So I followed people from an investment consultant uh, to nurses, to construction workers, to people who were unhoused and unemployed or people who we often think of you know, as the typical criminal defendant. In Boston, Black and Hispanic defendants are overrepresented in district and superior courts relative to the share of the population. Um, so statewide, Black people are incarcerated at eight times the rate of white people and Hispanic people are incarcerated at five times the rate of white people. And I interviewed not just defendants, but also prosecutors, public defenders, and judges, 
And then I also followed a subsample of defendants who, uh, many of whom I had interviewed, uh, to court, and then also into their private conversations with their lawyers so that I could see and unpack the attorney-client relationship unfolding in real time. And from the perspective of someone who didn't have really a stake in either side, right, of the relationship. So I wasn't a lawyer and I also wasn't a defendant. And so I got to see these privileged attorney-client interactions unfold and see why they worked in some cases and then why they didn't work in other cases. So my theoretical approach and also my analyses focused on the unit or the level of analysis of the attorney-client relationship. And I found when I was interviewing defendants that this was a central feature of their experience of injustice. So we often talk about prosecutors forcing plea deals. We often talk about unfair judges in the courts. But often for the, the, from the defendant's perspective, their primary interactions with the court are mediated through their lawyer. And that's sort of who they recognize as if they think of the system as unjust, of, as unjust, often that's through their lawyer that they're recognizing that injustice. So um, in the first chapter, I begin by describing people's everyday lives prior to their encounters with courts and their lawyers. And I think it's really important in, in the book for me to detail who these people are outside of their encounters with the legal system and get a full portrait and picture of their everyday lives. But also it's not just important sort of just to get that picture because people are more than simply their criminal record, but it's also important to get that picture because their everyday lives profoundly influence how they interacted and, and the relationships they were able to build with their attorneys. So I explain how people from vastly different social positions, again, from different race and class backgrounds, all still wound up being arrested and arraigned in courts in Boston. So nearly everyone in the study, rich and poor alike, experienced what I refer to as alienation um, and hardships in their adolescence. So among the privileged, um, their alienation and their resultant criminalized behaviors that they engage in to cope with alienation were often overlooked by parents. And they were often typically framed as pleasurable diversions. So engaging in drug use and drug dealing and larceny for example. Whereas these very same behaviors among the disadvantaged were surveilled by police and they were understood as necessary in a context of racism and poverty. But at some point by design, everyone in my study wound up in court at least once in their lives. And their experiences of alienation and policing in their adolescence had profound implications for their perspectives on the law and on legal authority that they carried with them into the courtroom. And so in the rest of the book, chapters two through four, I examine how the court process unfolds differently along race and class lines. I think we've got a slight freeze uh, coming out of California. Um, I know Professor Claire was talking about the, the first part of his book, um, discussing that, that early alienation, uh, which, which to me, and I think Professor Simonson might be on the same page here, I, I, um, I read it as sort of all the adverse childhood experiences um, that people who often have contact with the criminal legal system have experienced and that manifestation of them. Um, and so those early chapters were really uh, Professor Claire um, really exploring these initial interactions and relationships uh, between each, each lawyer and, and the client. Um, and as I know he'll detail, he observed- really So sorry. I'm yeah, you're great. This is, you know, the Stanford Wi-Fi Silicon Valley. <laughs> you know, you think it's perfect, but it, it always messes up. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, I think I was talking about the disadvantaged um, and, and that's where you, you left off. Uh, so- I describe how the attorney-client relationship for disadvantaged people is one defined by withdrawal or a distance between a client and their lawyer. So withdrawal can occur with respect to disagreements about legal goals, as well as the paths to getting to those legal goals. And some defendants withdrawal manifests as struggle and resistance, whereas others manifest as resignation to the legal process as they deal with more pressing issues in their everyday lives, like struggles with addiction, disability, or housing. And so for middle class and some working class white defendants, the experience of the courts through their attorney-client relationship is profoundly different. So often they experience stigma and they're shocked by the court process because it's unfamiliar to them. It's a noticeable blemish on an otherwise seemingly you know, good life, but they do experience myriad privileges as they go through the process. So they often feel heard by their lawyers who are often private attorneys, but not always. 
And we can talk about why some middle-class people might be slotted into indigent defense. They are also respected by judges and prosecutors who afford them opportunities for rehabilitation, treatment, and second chances because they're perceived to be compliant. Their relationships with lawyers are what I refer to as relationships of delegation, which occur when clients are inexperienced with the law, find that their lawyers engage with them on their terms in terms that they find mutually understandable and interpretable, and feel that they can ultimately defer to their lawyer's legal expertise. So by comparing these two groups, I reveal how disadvantaged defendants often have far greater knowledge of their legal rights. They're much sharper thinkers about the law. And that's because it's gleaned from prior experiences with the law that they've had throughout their lives or from vicarious experiences shared in their communities, in jail and other settings. They're also much more actively engaged in trying to fight their court cases. Yet their lawyers caught between the power and expectations of prosecutors and judges, coerce them to take plea deals, silence them in front of judges, and grow tired of defendants whom they feel have imprecise knowledge of court norms. So these dynamics have important implications for how scholars and also the general public typically understands the basic building blocks of race and class inequality in institutional interactions in the United States. So much of what we know about the international interactional dynamics of privilege in American society comes from research on mainstream institutions, such as schools and doctor's offices. So scholars commonly have shown that middle-class or privileged or advantaged people tend to be very assertive, demanding, and knowledgeable in these spaces. Whereas disadvantaged people are portrayed by researchers as deferential to authorities and rarely making demands for accommodations. But in the courts, the dynamics are so much different, or far different. It is the disadvantage who have greater knowledge of the law and who seek to make demands by exercising their rights. And their relatively worse of treatment arises from the unwritten rules, expectations, and structural constraints of a profoundly unjust legal system. The last thing I wanna share is that much of this book was inspired by and written alongside the Black Lives Matter movement. So in graduate school, I was actually motivated even to begin studying the courts after marching in the streets following George Zimmerman's acquittal in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And I wondered what kind of legal system would allow a man to kill a boy out of nothing more than anti-Black fear, while at the same time continually sending young Black men to prison every day for far less. And today, as we talk about Rikers and we observe what's happening there, and in the wake of killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Adam Toledo, and so many others, I see this book as contributing to work around transformation and abolition, not just of police and prisons, but also of the courts. And so in the book's conclusion, I, respect, I reflect on three levels of transformation required to bring about justice of some form in the courts from the level of the attorney-client interaction, which is the main unit of analysis in the study, but also to the level of society, where we must rethink the way that we deal with and prevent criminalized social problems and harms. So I hope I don't uh, lose you all again, but I will jump right back on if I do, because I really am looking forward to, to having these important conversations with you all. Thanks. Professor Claire, thank you so much uh, for first writing this book uh, and for that really concise um, overview that you've given us. And I, if folks don't already have your book, they need to go buy it. I assume where all books are sold. <laughs> um, if you're if you're local in Brooklyn, Greenlight is my favorite bookstore. Um, but I, I I was just so thrilled to pick this up um, as Professor Simonson opened with. Um, I was in the midst of uh, revising this article, Black on Black Representation. I think when your book was published. Published. Um, and I saw it very much as being in conversation with um, so much of what I've been thinking about, but, but Derek Bell wrote this article that came out in the California Law Review, and I don't know if this was on your radar, it was the early 70s, um, looking at racism in American courts. Uh, black disruption or despair. And he talked about just what you're getting at with um, under-resourced clients who are appointed counsel, lack of agency don't trust the lawyer, don't want to delegate, as you say, you know, privileged clients more readily cede control and delegate, and then they uh, disrupt the proceedings. And you share this, this, this anecdote comes up repeatedly throughout the book that um, folks who have appointed counsel, lack of agency, lack of choice, don't feel like they are being represented. 
don't feel like their story is being told. Um, so, so Derek Bell gives us this snapshot in the early 70s, and I see this book very much in conversation with, but also moving forward. Um, and so I was, I was you know, thrilled <laughs> uh, to, to, to have it as a resource and a guide as I thought through the relationships between um, an indigent person. My, my, my paper was focused mostly on, on indigent defendants and their lawyers and that initial formation of the relationship, um, the development of trust, um, and ideally a relationship in which a client can feel like their story is being told and they can cede control. And what I uh, noticed throughout the book is that uh, this wasn't a central focus for you, but this idea of choice and agency, and, and you sort of posit, you know, people that can choose their lawyer who, who are economically privileged, have the ability to hire someone, that can ease the trust formation, that can ease the ability uh, for uh, delegation to happen. And you note, and it's almost in passing, that indigent clients um, complained about not getting to select their lawyer, particularly those with bar advocates. Um, and you notice a, a distinction between bar ad, the advocacy that bar advocates give and the advocacy that, that some institutional public defenders give. And for our New Yorkers, bar advocates are like 18B panel attorneys. Um, and so I wonder then, what, what is the intervention for indigent clients? Um, how do we address this um, lack of, of agency? the inability to exercise sort of choice, um, to feel empowered. Um, is it extending counsel of choice, the right to counsel of choice to low income people, which is an argument I make, but I'm, I'm selfishly <laughs> wanna know your, your position on that. Yeah, thanks for pulling that out of the book. Um, and it's, it's really important and central to how, how I think about sort of, right, we're in a relationship, there is, Pop, there are possibilities in any relationship. It can go really great. It can go really south, right? And I think the relationships that go bad and go south, it's because of frustration over the ability for one of the interaction partners to be able to share what they want and for the person to listen and also not just listen, but also to be able to effectively do what the person wants, right? Um, and so, you know, I think with respect to thinking about what the solution is. It depends on sort of what we want from the court system or specifically what the client wants from the court system. And so for some clients, they do want a marginally better outcome. They do want you know, a good negotiation of a plea deal. Maybe they recognize that they did do something wrong. They're ready to admit it, but they don't want that harsh of a punishment. And so in those situations, I think, making sure that they have a lawyer who's really listening to them, really listening to their needs and what they want from the process with respect to getting a slightly better legal outcome is one way to move forward and, and then therefore affording choice, right? Um, and the ability of the client to be able to choose and select their attorney could help in that. But also, and, and so that, but, but I would argue that, you know, to some extent, that's also just about sort of maybe the feel of justice, right? If we think that the system generally is unjust, Right, um, And if we feel more broadly that the legal system and court processing is problematic and people shouldn't have any punitive uh, aspect to, uh, to their sentence at all whatsoever, they shouldn't be going through the legal process in this way, then maybe sort of making relationships better right, and making the attorney-client relationship uh, feel better is actually not the ultimate goal that we should be achieving. Um, and so you know, I sort of, at the end of the book, get to the conclusion where I think that you know, in the short term, it's really important for us to make these relationships stronger and better. But the goal of these relationships being stronger or better shouldn't be the typical sort of mitigating a legal sentence, making it slightly better for the defendant, but actually more resistant, transformational, and abolitionist uh, ways of engaging in the criminal legal system as a public defender and in the attorney-client relationship. And I think that can come from listening to clients who are ready to contest unjust police practices, file motions that really question sort of the basics of what counts as reasonable suspicion or probable cause and things like that. And that's a different kind of attorney-client relationship. Um, and so anyway, with respect to choice though, more broadly, I think one thing that's really interesting that I found with respect to the book was choice is so central um, for privileged people, not just for disadvantaged people. And that helps to explain why privileged relationships are so much better. Um, because with the privilege of being able to choose an attorney and also opt out of the attorney-client relationship, it's basically like an insurance policy for the defendant. 
Um, so for a privileged defendant who's paying for services or paying for, for a client or uh, for uh, counsel, they're able to decide, you know, this relationship isn't working for me, which is something that's not afforded to disadvantaged defendants. I'm just going to jump in since I'm manning the chat and I am seeing everyone's comments, so keep them coming. We do have an 18B lawyer in our virtual audience um, who uh, wants us to know that they too have trouble um, developing relationships with their clients. You know, in New York, uh, 18B is an appointed counsel, but who's not coming from a public defender office. So it goes, I think, to how every place is different, but also that the dynamics are going to change depending on where you are, but also depending on whether somebody's paying for their lawyer or not. So keep the comments coming. Yes. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Professor Cliff. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I think uh, so 18B lawyers in New York, bar advocates in uh, Massachusetts are sort of the contracted appointed counsel who typically sit uh, and practice in the private bar, but may sit court appointed um, and pick up some cases, or maybe their entire caseload is court appointed indigent defendants, but they don't at all, uh, you know, uh, but they're not within the public defense office and they're not staff public defenders. I'll say that, you know, for many clients, and I wonder if this is the case in New York too, I found actually they rarely knew, unless they were very wise to the system, whether their attorney was a public defender or um, a court appointed bar advocate. And I think that matters um, for many public defenders in particular, because I think often in the public defenders that I embedded with, they felt like they had certain resources and certain abilities. If only their client would trust them, then they could you know, pursue those avenues. And they felt like the public pretender stereotype was unfair for them given their actually deep commitment um, that they, some of them felt to being able uh, to help their clients and also resist and, and move forward in the system in the way that many of their clients wanted. Um, but because of experiences of discrimination that clients who had been through the system previously many times had with bar advocates who may not have been on the same page, who may not be as willing to uh, you know, um, contest unjust police practices or litigate certain motions. Maybe they think certain motions are frivolous that a public defender might not think of as frivolous. Um, because of that, they sort of immediately entered into new attorney-client relationships, assuming that this person, whether they're a public defender or a bar advocate, this defense attorney is just not going to listen to me. So why should I even try, right, to explain my legal goals and legal avenues that I want to pursue? Um, to get to those legal goals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and another strain that I picked up, um, again, this is like the lens that I was, I was looking through as I was researching for my paper was uh, this idea of there can be elements of cultural identity, uh, whether that's class or race, um, that can help a, um, a client and a lawyer build trust more readily. Um, they have this sort of uh, built-in trust and rapport uh, when there are certain aspects of, of culture that, that are in common. Um, and you discuss how when uh, there are cultural differences, and I mean beyond race, because you talk about this you know, in, in relation to privilege as well, um, that when there are cultural differences, it can be harder, right? There are obstacles in place then uh, that make that relationship uh, and trust building more difficult. Um, and particularly for our, our students, many of whom our budding public defenders are already representing clients through our clinics, um, in the um, criminal court system, family defense, also in the immigration context. Um, and they may have lots of different uh, aspects of culture and identity and how, what advice do you have uh, for advocates uh, who don't have that sort of ready rapport building uh, built in um, and, and how can they supplement, supplement that potentially through sort of um, cultural competency or, or other things that you noted during the, the research of, of, your, of your book? Yeah, so yeah, so cultural sort of compatibility or, or similarity did matter a lot for uh, the defendants in the study. And I think one thing that really mattered was uh, when clients, when it worked well and there was sort of a shared uh, understandings, was when clients felt that their lawyers, even if they came from different class or social backgrounds, at least their lawyers took the time to try to understand their clients and not make assumptions about them or about their social position. So one example I think that's pretty clear in the book is Timothy's example uh, experience. And this is actually, so Timothy was a black 
uh, poor defendant who actually had a black lawyer, right? And he was so excited actually that this, you know, I finally I have a black woman lawyer and assumed that maybe this lawyer then would be able to understand you know, his needs and have sort of more sort of understanding of his background and how he grew up. But ultimately, um, while that was exciting initially, and he hoped that would lead to a positive attorney-client relationship, ultimately he found that this lawyer kept stereotyping on the basis of class differences. And so, he so this lawyer, she assumed that he, you know, uh, even though his criminal record looked like it did in the state of Massachusetts, she kept asking him, are you sure you don't have any other record in other states? I just can't believe that your record is so light, given your socioeconomic circumstances. Um, and so I think not assuming things about clients and letting clients lead with what their truth is and what their reality is, is really important. And I think clients can really pick up early on if you're skeptical of the stories and accounts that they're giving. And of course, right, to some extent, you do want to know, right, things like this that you don't want to surprise you in later parts of the criminal legal process. But I think there are careful ways of asking clients or checking um, and verifying things without making a client feel like you're judging them. Um, I think the other thing that is, is interesting and something that I saw uh, that Sybil, who is a black lawyer, black woman lawyer who I follow deeply, she's a public defender, did really well, especially with her other black clients, which sort of goes against, right? This is more the black on black representation. This is the possibilities and the positiveness of matching on race and how it can really lead to a really positive interaction was um, so, and, and so, you know, I don't think there's like a clear uh, story of like, if you have a black lawyer and a black defendant, you're going to get better justice. I think it's really about the dynamics that, uh, that are possible in each of these relationships. But anyway, so Sybil is a black woman lawyer. She talked a lot about a lot of black clients who she had heard stories about them previously, um, you know, having lawyers who may be overly familiar with them or maybe feel like, oh, I know like what your life is like, even though they have no idea what it was like. So the flip of like not assuming things about clients is also don't be overly familiar, right? You're still a professional and they want someone who's gonna be a professional and someone who's going to represent them uh, well in front of the, in the eyes of the court. And so I think for Sybil, it was a dance between in private conversations, you know, listening um, and, and, and really understanding their perspective and then in uh, public court proceedings, really maintaining professionalism and showing them that I'm gonna be someone who's gonna guide you through this process. And I'm someone who's a respected uh, part of the legal system. And that mattered for some defendants. Some defendants though wanted Sybil to be not respectable and to be resistant in the legal system. And so I think knowing what your client wants is, is really important along those dimensions. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is one thing that many clients in the book found to be very useful was when their lawyer protected them, um, from judges and prosecutors uh, in, in a way where uh, basically a judge might shame a defendant or something like that in court. And um, a lawyer would allow that to happen, but then later on, the lawyer would take the person aside, the client aside and say, hey, that was messed up what just happened. I am literally on your side. I understand what you're going through. And so I think sometimes lawyers forget and assume that their clients know that they're on their side and that any disrespect or shaming that they're receiving from judges or prosecutors or any conversations that they're having with prosecutors to negotiate deals, they assume, oh, my client knows why I'm doing that, right? It makes sense to my client why I would be doing that because that's the best way to get, you know, um, some plea deal that's going to be marginally better for them. But actually many clients feel like that's you um, violating their trust and not being on their side. And so constant reiteration of uh, I'm on your side and this is how we're going to get through this together. Yeah, these um, small moments of really bearing witness and, and affirming and acknowledging injustice in this larger um, setting of criminal court. Um, and that's such an important point that you make, and I know resonated uh, and resonates with our students. Um, something that we've, we've already touched on um, is, um, you know, your, your focus is really uh, on, on observing and looking at the individual relationships between lawyers and, and clients. Um, obviously, you're like physically in, you know, the Boston, Suffolk County criminal court system. So you're noticing trends and patterns and larger structural forces. Um, and I know Jocelyn and I, I think a lot about this, um, but, um, you know, th there's this short-term attempt of improving sort of the process, uh, these small fixes um, between individual relationship formation, uh, potentially training, cultural competency, but really it's the, the, the whole system uh, is classist. The whole system 
is racist. Um, and, and I know Nicole um, Gonzalez Van Cleve has written about in Crook County, in, in Cook County, Illinois, um, the, the, uh, the very setting of the criminal adjudication process um, uh, perpetuates, criminal defense lawyers perpetuate this sort of structural racism. I know you've cited Richardson and off and they, uh, the public defender triage that, um, you know, public defenders are part of this system that is, is meant to really subjugate people, um, disempowered people. And so um, I don't want to jump too far ahead <laughs> uh, with, your, with your California Law Review article, but I couldn't help but think that after um, doing this research, writing this book, uh, that you have thoughts about um, what a better way of, of, of delivering and securing justice could look like. Um, and, and I know in that article, you do conclude that we need to abolish criminal courts, uh, that we need to replace it uh, with an opportunity for restorative justice, uh, community-led sort of initiatives that can repair harm. Um, I, I, I don't mean to deviate too hard from the book in this moment, but I just really want to bring your other work and thoughts and scholarship into the conversation. Yeah, I think, you know, after doing sort of the rigorous empirical analysis, following several attorney, several attorney client relationships in detail, taking so many copious field notes and then writing it all up, I got to the conclusion of the book thinking, okay, what's the big takeaway here? Is it that we need attorney client relationships? to be like those of the privileged, where you're delegating expertise and you're going along with the system? Probably not actually, because a lot of disadvantaged defendants want a lot more from the system that the system cannot provide the way it's currently set up. The way the current, the current system is set up is to compel people to plead guilty, to admit fault, um, often for things that they did not do or for things that are much, far, or, or much more nuanced than the court record allows. Um, and it's also set up for people to do it in a way where they give no uh, indication of admitting their actual fault other than the plea colloquy, right? They're just like repeating statements. Yeah, I plead guilty, sure. But there's no meaningful interaction with people who are survivors of harm, who are victims. There's no meaningful interrogation, right, of the things that may have caused uh, this harm to occur in the first place. And so I think the courts are just a place where I'm not sure we could ever get justice. And so one sort of phrase that I repeat throughout the book is that representation is not justice. Mm -hmm. I could work really, really hard on improving the attorney-client relationship, improving indigent defense. But I think both historically and today, the evidence suggests that even when we increase resources to indigent defense, when we increase sort of the stages at which you can be provided a defense attorney, um, where and when, for what cases you can be provided a defense attorney, the same thing is still occurring. Yeah. The majority of people of color, marginalized people along economic lines are paraded through the system and processed, end up in jail and prison, uh, on probation, which makes them susceptible to police surveillance and pulled back into the system. And it happens over and over again. And so what I'm trying to do in the conclusion of the book and also in the California Law Review much uh, more clearly, but in the conclusion of the book, I'm sort of like, here, look, here are the things that I think matter if we want to slightly improve this system and make it a little less bad, um, which I totally think is important because making the system a little less bad is going to have a big effect on people, on, on certain individual people's lives, no doubt. Um, there will be people who would be alive today um, if they weren't right, in jail uh, after, uh, you know, not being able to afford their bail amount um, on Rikers Island. And so there are different jurisdictions that do better at allowing people to get out on bail, at actually inquiring into people's ability to pay, at really making bail about whether you're going to return to court, not whether we're going to punish you because you have a lengthy criminal record, right? So I think these reforms do matter. At the same time, I think we have to be careful, just like any abolitionist would suggest, that we make sure that we're only going through with non-reformist reforms that pull down the scale of the system um, and help to build up alternatives. And so in the California Law Review piece, I really am thinking much more broadly about what alternatives could look like, what replacements could look like to courts. And I think it's a question of what do we mean when we say justice and, and what do we want from justice? And so I think one thing is important is it needs to be much 
more democratic. And, you know, I, I really think Professor Simonson's work here is very influential in my thinking and others with respect to shifting power and understanding that the management of social harm and also the definition of social harm really needs to be something that's democratically done in local communities. And then also the response to harm also needs to be something that's democratically agreed on. Um, and they're gonna be debates and some debates might lead to punitive measures and we need to fight to make sure that they don't, right? And we need to fight to make sure that we don't allow punitive state measures uh, to lead the way and convince people that there are better alternatives for both preventing harm, but then also I think with respect to the court, we need to think of what's the alternative for holding people accountable after they cause harm, because that's what the court is supposed to do. It's not really, I don't think, uh, ideologically meant uh, to prevent harm. That's what the police ideologically function is supposed to tell us that it's doing, even though it doesn't. But ideologically, I think the function of the court is how do we hold people accountable after they've harmed? And so I think that's where we get models like Daniel Sered's uh, Common Justice, um, you know, other sort of uh, restorative justice models and processes um, like um, the peacemaking courts uh, where you all are in New York um, and others which allow for an alternative mechanism that doesn't allow for a punitive lever at the end of it, but also allows for there to be actual conversation and restoration between people um, who have caused harm and people who have been harmed. Thank you for that and for the shout out uh, to my work. Um, I want to jump in with a couple of questions. There are some great questions coming in in the chat and also the Q&A that I'm seeing. Um, I think a lot of people are really interested in thinking about abolition and what it can mean, but we also have a lot of future lawyers and lawyers in our virtual room trying to think through what does it mean to be a lawyer particularly a public defender from a couple of these questions, but really, just, or a prosecutor, or a lawyer who's making the choice not to go into the courtroom, whatever it may be, what does it mean to be a lawyer within or around a criminal system that doesn't feel legitimate, doesn't feel right, or even with, you know, it, maybe someone has the clarity of, I don't think it should be there at all, or maybe there's just deep questioning um, and ambivalence, what does it mean to be a lawyer in that situation? Um, and so I'm gonna read a couple of ways that this question has come out. Um, and then I wanna tell a story from earlier this week and then uh, bring it back to you to sort of take this, you know, um, ideal abolitionist horizon and think about where lawyers fit in. Um, so one question uh, from Heath is, what are ways that public defenders can advocate abolition? Would forcing every case to trial or striking be effective tactics? That's one question. Um, then we also in the Q&A from a, a, an anonymous question, with so many incredible Black, Latinx, and Brown lawyers out there, how would you suggest that non-people of color future lawyers support in the fight against racism in the criminal justice system? Ultimately, how do we help while avoiding the white savior complex? So two great questions getting at different aspects of you know, either attorney complicity or the ability to resist or puncture the legitimacy of a system that you're also working within. So I would I'd love to hear actually from both of you thoughts about this, but I did want to tell a quick story from earlier this week. Um, I was in Brooklyn criminal court on Monday. Um, and the reason I was there is because of an action that was put together by something called the Fibro Defenders in New York City. So that's a uh, public defenders from all the different public defender offices in New York City. We have many of them. That's a long story for those of you who don't live here. Um, uh, work together and have actually, since around the time I was a public defender um, more than 10 years ago, um, to uh, around different kinds of advocacy or collective projects. And it's varied over time. But after these 12 deaths in New York City custody, including the most recent one on Rikers Island, um, this group of public defenders said we can't um, just be representing our individual clients, we should be engaging in collective action. And the action that day was to ask people to come sit in court, uh, pack the courtrooms, court watch, um, while in all five boroughs, a public defender read out the names of everyone who had died in custody this year um, and made a demand after speaking to the client who they were talking to to let them know they were doing this, uh, made a demand that everybody today be released uh, because to send somebody to Rikers Island is a death sentence. 
And then at noon in every borough, the public defenders walked out again from different offices um, and walked out of the courtroom in protest, um, trying to also sort of show that it's not just the mayor or the governor who controls who's incarcerated, but that people in that courtroom, district attorneys, judges, defense lawyers, and also by the way, court officers who were yelling at us to get out. Um, and I tell that story, I went there because I asked uh, some students, some of you are actually in this virtual room, if they'd be interested in coming. So we went um, and it felt like a powerful thing, but it was also just an action and an action is only you know one moment in a larger building of power. And it was an action in which um, it was almost all lawyers there, although um, there were some people who were either current clients or formerly incarcerated who were talking. Um, so I can say more about that action if people are interested, but I say it not as an answer, but really as a question. Like that was powerful, but also limited. So what are ways that um, somebody can both be a lawyer in a system and also um, try to change it or even abolish it? Um, so Professor Claire, I'll start with you, but I wanna hear from both of you. Okay, yeah. So, you know, I think one thing that's really important for lawyers to think carefully and critically about is different kinds of clients on two dimensions who are disadvantaged. There are some who really seriously just want to limit their entanglement in the system and just want to get through this and just need you to just kind of do what I sort of argue is the typical way that lawyers think about representing their clients, which I refer to in chapter four as sort of mitigating legal outcomes. The second client type that I that I sort of pull out is people who are much more interested in basically gumming up the system and taxing the courts and contesting police violence and abuse and thinking not just about their case as an individual case for me as an individual, but as illustrative of something broader, a broader problem, and are willing to risk things for potential broader change. And I think specifically in that example that you were mentioning, I think I read some reporting around the public defender who decided to read those names asked their client, is this okay if I do this, right? Because that could actually have a, an impact on the client. And I don't know if it did have an impact on the bail hearing. I don't know what was going through the judge's mind, but you could imagine a judge would be annoyed and would take it out on the client. And that's something that I think having frank conversations with every client about is like, are we going to do this? Are we going to, you know, really like resist the system or are we just kind of going to go along? And it's okay for clients who want to go along. But I think the abolitionist perspective would also suggest that taking on those clients and acknowledging and recognizing those clients who want to resist is really important. And so, you know, the question of forcing to trial or the savior complex, I think are also touching on these issues, right? It's like, you, you know, whether you're white or privileged along other dimensions or simply just privileged by the fact that you're a lawyer and they are a client who's facing a criminal charge, even if in everyday life you all are along similar lines, you know, uh, with respect to your social position, that power that's embedded in your authority as a member of the court, you really do need to think about, you know, whether you are uh, suggesting something to a client because you personally have political stakes and motivation. This goes back to what Professor Hogg was talking about with respect to, you know, Derek Bell's work in writing, right? This idea that a lawyer often has different things in mind, political ideas and things that they think are better, right, for their client, but clients often have things that they want and maybe goals that aren't as large. So um, I think the way forward then is to identify clients who are ready to resist and go along with them and resist with them. And so not taking every case to trial, but taking cases to trial that you think might have a chance, a good chance of losing, but if the client's on board and recognizes that, go ahead with it. Uh, litigating motions that you think probably have chances of failing, but if the client is, is wanting to do that and there's something either symbolically meaningful, like changing the court record and putting an officer on the stand and seeing an officer lie to their face and, and, and being able to contest that, even if the motion is going to fail, uh, that might be symbolically powerful and important, but it also might create you know, a record that, that matters for appeal and other things. So those would be my initial thoughts, but I'm so curious uh, what you think. Um, I, I too think a lot about this. Um, and um, Nicole um, Smith Futrell, uh, she's at CUNY Law. She teaches a criminal defense clinic there. Um, I hope her article is either out or is about to come out, but it's in the NYU Law Review of Social Change. But looking at the practice and pedagogy of abolition within the context of criminal defense. 
clinic. Um, and you know, having talked to Nicole um, during the process of writing this article, uh, we both shared the fact that you know, as law students, um, for me, it was about 15 years ago, thinking about, um, I want to be a public defender. At civil rights, I want to uh, put my head down and zealously represent the client in front of me. Um, and then encountering law students today, they're like, yes, I want to be a public defender, but I want to take down the whole system. And they're thinking so much larger scale, bigger picture in a way that I, I couldn't even conceive of. Um, so in many ways, our students may be ahead of us already. <laughs> And we're the ones playing catch up. Um, but when I think about talking about these issues, you know, in class, and, and I'm teaching, you know, doctrinal courses now, um, but but to let students know that they have the, the power to push for change. I mean, we just had this discussion and evidence um, that, you know, I want to bring up the critical analysis of the rules of evidence, uh, because as future members of the bar and advocates, we have the power to change these, um, change these policies. Um, and when I look at the Black Public Defender Association, I don't know if you've come across uh, BBT, BPDA <laughs> um, in, in your work, uh, Matt, but um, it's, it's a relatively new organization sort of under the umbrella of the National Lawyers Association for Criminal Defense Lawyers, um, but it's Black public defenders um, who are using their um, knowledge and expertise and proximity to the communities, uh, whether from personal experience or just being public defenders, to elevate the voices and the experiences of their clients and to push for large scale change with lawmakers in their local communities at the state level and nationally. Um, and one of their first um, uh, initiatives, I think uh, this, this year was to write a, uh, a report to Biden and Harris looking at the carceral systems, plural, outside of just the criminal legal system, but within the immigration context and family defense, but really taking on this extra additional role as an advocate and, and change maker, um, and then moving aside to elevate the voices and the experiences of their clients to push for this kind of large scale change. Um, and again, I mean, and, and I don't know if this is true for you, Jocelyn, but in in law school, I wasn't thinking this broadly. <laughs> um, and I am I am so heartened by the students, particularly at Brooklyn Law School, um, that are I, I want to overhaul, dismantle the system and to create something, replace it with something that's more just. Um, and you were getting to this, uh, Professor Claire, and at the end of your comments about abolition. Um, but I, um, yeah, I, I think I don't have all the answers, but I have, I do have a lot of thoughts and, and I, I'm really excited about the work uh, that's happening with um, the Black Public Defender Association, Law for Black Lives uh, is another relatively newer organization um, that exists not just within uh, sort of criminal defense and indigent defense context, but looking across the board um, at really um, empowering encouraging lawyers to empower the, the, the very clients that they work um, and serve to elevate their voices and experiences to push for, for this kind of change. Yeah, thank you both. I just want to, you know, uh, Nicole, Nicole Smith-Futrell and I are actually colleagues. We were public defenders together. Um, and I think I can say confidently that while, um, and it sounds like this goes for you too, we might have had the emotions or the reactions about the system that mirror ones we have now. Uh, we didn't have the analysis. Um, and when I see the exciting analysis now, I see it coming from law students. I see it coming from young people involved in movements. I see it coming from people who have been incarcerated, have gained the analysis there, and now are teaching us how the system really works in ways that for me, I don't know from my own experience. And so I often feel hopeful when I'm talking to people about the system, but then I go and sit in a courtroom um, and feel uh, devastated all over again. Um, I would like to bring out um, a couple of other themes. We just have some really great questions. People are reacting in a couple of different ways. Um, one is actually to go back to uh, the field work that you did. Um, as you were talking, I think as we've all been talking, people are having questions. And so I'm going to just throw out a few specific questions about things you may or may not have seen in your field work, not for you to answer all of them, but to see if any of these sort of um, bring out an anecdote or something you noticed that um, you could share with us. Because it's fun to read what's in the book, 
but also like, you know, the stuff that maybe got cut out or that, um, you know, is important in a different context. So here are a few. Um, there's a question about whether uh, you saw people who were immigrants or non-citizens accused of crimes and whether that changes the dynamic that you saw. Um, there's a question about Brady violations or uh, exculpatory evidence, or maybe we could just have a broader question about, you know, how did you notice lawyers talking about what evidence there was and what evidence there was not um, with their clients? Um, there's a question about juries, and that's a great question. There aren't a lot of jury trials in your book, probably because there aren't a lot of jury trials in real life. Uh, but still, in theory, criminal court is supposed to happen in the shadow of jury trials. Um, and those have a lot of uh, race and class issues built into them as well. Um, another question uh, involves gender. Gender dynamics, in my experience with juries, actually, were one of the most um, visible or dynamics that you could feel, but also sort of uh, gender dynamics between lawyers and clients. Um, and uh, I'll stop there, but I think uh, one other maybe question is where were the prosecutors and in, in what you were seeing? Yeah, so a lot of great questions and I'll try to answer most of them. Um, so where were the prosecutors? So prosecutors uh, were the frustration of defense attorneys. They were the reason and the thing that they had to explain why they couldn't do certain things or why things would operate in a certain way. But so were judges as well. The frustration of explaining how one judge may interpret something differently than the client has interpreted, specifically with respect oftentimes to the nature of the police stop and what counts as you know, reasonable suspicion for a stop or probable cause for an arrest. There was a lot of thought and a lot of, I think, accurate thinking and theorizing about what those legal concepts should mean among disadvantaged defendants. The difficulty is, of course, it doesn't comport with how judges have interpreted case law. Um, Gender, I think, is a really important aspect to consider. And I think in particular, considering the ways that gender works for some women, specifically white women who are clients versus how it might work for black women who are clients. And so I don't have a large number of women in the study, but I do have, I think it's 11 women in the study who I got to know either through interviews or following them. And I definitely noticed a difference along racial lines among women. So uh, many of the Black women in the study would tell me about racism that they'd experience or they'd reflect, maybe if I'm sitting in court, they'd say, shout out, you know, my lawyers are racist MF, you know, can you believe he said this thing to me? Um, whereas I begin chapter three, actually, with Brianna, who is a white woman, um, and her lawyer literally calls her, refers to her as a cute white girl as an explanation as to why this is going to be such an easy process for her, and also an explanation as to why she's enjoying as a lawyer working with her, because she's an easier client who she doesn't have to do much to convince to a judge or a jury that, you know, this client is someone who's just not the typical defendant. And so we need to work hard to really understand the nuances of her background, why she could end up here, right? And then find a way to excuse whatever, you know, crime we accuse her of committing. And it actually worked out. It worked out and there was a jury trial and it actually worked out for her well. Uh, there was a jury trial with respect to um, her OUI, but not with respect to the drug possession uh, with, uh, in addition to the operating under the influence, which they called in Massachusetts. She was driving a car under the influence. So she got off and was acquitted there. Uh, the jury trial went beautifully, partly because she was quote unquote a cute white girl, um, whereas the uh, the drug possession also ended in, um, she had probation, but then it went away. Um, and it, it basically was what in Massachusetts is referred to as a continuation without a finding. Um, so really light sentence. Um, and, and I think gender and race played a role in those interactions in the attorney-client relationship, but also the ultimate legal outcome that came from those interactions. Um, and I think speaking of juries a little bit more, you know, yeah, juries were not a common feature among the people who I spoke to. Uh, most of the people ended up taking a plea deal. Some, their cases were dismissed, uh, but getting to the jury stage was rare. And, and one sort of story that I sort of begin the book with is the story of Arnold, who's a middle-class Black defendant, who actually establishes a really wonderful relationship uh, with his lawyer because they sort of sort of culturally align in various ways. They're both college basketball players. They understood what it means to be a college basketball player. His lawyer also, even though he was a white man, was readily willing to understand and accept the racism of the police stop um, and the reason why he was stopped in the first place. 
and also uh, truly believe that he didn't possess the gun that was found in the car. Um, and uh, it was a bench trial actually that they ultimately went to, but I talk about the story because, you know, we often think that clients uh, may sort of have a preference for, you know, deciding whether they want to go to a bench trial, jury trial, or trial generally, or, or take a plea deal. But sometimes actually in uh, de relationships with delegation, positive relationships, there can be a convincing of, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, convincing of clients of like, actually, this is a better option for these reasons, but that can only come about in positive attorney-client relationships. So there may be disadvantaged, not positive attorney-client relationships where the client's idea or strategy or goal is something that they're very adamant about, um, but actually they could be convinced otherwise if only they were afforded a lawyer who they felt like listened to them, understood where they're coming from. And so really building that trust, I think is really critical because in Arnold's case, for example, he was adamant about going to a jury trial, but his lawyer convinced him to take a bench trial instead because of the whiteness of the jury uh, that would likely be seated in that county that he was sitting in, in Western Massachusetts. So um, those are some thoughts uh, from stories in the book with respect to some of those, some of those questions. That's great, thank you. Um, you know, the, another set of questions I'm seeing, so if, if just now we were talking about things that are in the book, then there's a set of questions that are, that are not about the protagonists of the book, people accused of crimes and, and their defenders. Um, and those are thinking about prosecutors and thinking about people who are harmed um, or victims. Um, or perhaps kind of public safety more broadly, which I do think is a, a big part of your story. Um, so there are, uh, you know, um, a couple of questions about where prosecutors fit in. And I think the questions are getting, again, at sort of two different things. One is in the courtroom, which you talked about a little bit in terms of how they're viewed. Um, but I think also just more broadly in thinking about change, um, whether we're um, calling it abolition um, which I think the three of us are, or thinking about um, reducing racism and classism in a system um, that is hard to deny just on its face and how it operates. Um, so some questions include, um, how do you see the role of prosecutors in the system? Are there models of prosecutors working to push the system in a more just focused direction? Um, there's a question um, about people who are harmed and how they fit in. Um, it's not in this question, but I think that there's um, real questions of agency and dismissal of people who are harmed who either are trying to engage with the legal system or don't want to engage with the legal system and how we, uh, you know, as a lawyers or as a system can honor and respect them um, and try to help them uh, feel safe um, and feel like um, they're, uh, the state is supporting them. Um, and then there's a question um, um, about sort of abolition and how we uh, categorize or measure crime and whether, um, you know, in thinking more broadly looking forward about abolition, um, <clears throat> whether it matters or whether we can measure the success of reform based on uh, crime rates. You know, those crime rates are in the news a lot this week. Or we could think, even if we're not going by FBI crime rates, um, by how many people are harming each other, both within the system. Again, Rikers Island, just you know, right now as we're talking, there is violence and harm happening there. Or um, outwardly, surely right now out in Brooklyn, there is violence and harm happening somewhere. So um, there's a lot there, but uh, to either of you, you know, prosecutors, victims, safety more broadly, how do, how do we think about these things? Yeah, I can take a quick stab and then I'll turn it over to you, uh, Professor Hogg. So, uh, you know, I think with respect to crime, you know, and I often talk to my students, actually, I teach a crime and punishment in America class to undergrads, and I really get them to understand the construction of crime and what we've even criminalized, right? And that is very uh, racially and class biased, uh, and it's really elite's definitions of what counts as harm. So for a long time, you know, domestic violence in the home was not considered a crime. Um, it is today, but it's not really that, you know, even with VAWA, you know, the enforcement and the question of do police officers actually care? Are they able to even interpret what counts as a crime of domestic violence, right, um, is a question. But also police harm and police violence, we don't categorize that. You know, now uh, under the Obama administration, I think there was the beginning of asking for police departments to record and, and report 
right, the number of uh, deaths in police custody. But police departments rarely do it. They haven't really built up the infrastructure yet to do it is one argument. Or maybe they don't actually want to ever do that. And they have the ability not to uh, report to the federal government. So what we classify as crime, I think, is constructed. And so I hesitate to think uh, that we should be focused on these different crime measures as a way to assess whether abolition is working. The other thing I'll say is, you know, humans in interaction, harm is a pretty fundamental aspect of a lot that happens between humans. And I will say we're in a very safe moment in human history. Um, and so I think we're ready to be able to experiment a lot. And I think the harm of the carceral state is an immense harm that we often don't think about or capture. And so we really wanna weigh that harm that we're putting on a lot of people through the carceral state with whether this is really having an effect on other forms of harm that are typically thought about like, you know, violent crime rates and things like that. Um, the other thing I'll say uh, with respect to victims is, and you know, I talk about this in the book, but I think it's really important to understand that the court system is not working for victims. And I think part of that question acknowledges that. I think maybe the, I, I actually haven't looked at the questions, but the way you were phrasing, it sounds like the person is acknowledging really that, you know, the way the system is working, system actors aren't actually paying much attention to victims. And I think that's an intentional feature of the system, partly because I think that the system um, have, and even though the system says it cares about victims, right? And that's a motivation for harsh on punishment crimes. I actually think that the system is very concerned. I talk about this in the book as, a legitimated or procedural regularity and legitimated accuracy. So we have here professionals who are very concerned about the court record, about their professional status, about making sure you know that they can move on if they're you know a line prosecutor or a public defender. Maybe they want to be a judge someday. So they're really concerned about doing the right professional things and what's sort of interpreted as the right way to read certain uh, procedures and, and, and follow procedural regularity, basically. And that means that there are only certain times when victims are allowed to speak with a victim impact statement. There are only certain times when a client or a defendant is supposed to speak up, maybe when they're on the stand, maybe when they're taking the plea colloquy. There's very little incentive or time or space for people who have been harmed and for people who have harmed to actually come together, have a conversation. I think that's what's so wonderful about restorative justice as an alternative is this is the basic feature and goal of restorative justice is for people to sit down and understand what went wrong and try to come together, not just two individuals, but as a community to find a way to move forward to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, and so, you know, I talk about in the book that victims are losing out in this system of justice that we currently have as well. Last thing I'll say with respect to prosecutors, um, I think prosecutors totally can play a role. Um, I would hesitate though to laud progressive prosecutors and to sort of talk about the wonderfulness of reformist DAs. I think that does a lot of ideological work to legitimate the need for a DA's office or the need for prosecutors. I think what we can do and what many organizers on the ground do do and remind us to do is to advocate and of course vote for a prosecutor, but advocate and push prosecutors to decline to prosecute, right? Um, to really think about limiting their funding and, and, and the sort of scope of their offices. Um, but at the end of the day, an abolitionist vision does imagine a world where there are no prosecutor's offices. Of course, we'd find ways to be able to figure out how did someone harm another person and we need to figure out like, right, do some investigation to figure out that a murder occurred. Of course, that's necessary. But the role and goal of fundamentally prosecuting uh, people in a system that ultimately you're seeking harm, whether it's at the bail amount and keeping them in jail, or you're seeking harm uh, by like putting them on various uh, entanglements of probation, uh, which are thought of as alternatives, but are really violent, um, that should not be part of an abolitionist vision, I don't think. Um, I have so many thoughts in response to, to, to the ideas that you presented, um, and I find myself nodding in agreement as you're speaking. Um, but to pick up on, on crime and, and rates of crime, um, I really thank Khalil uh, Muhammad for writing The Condemnation of Blackness um, and really pointing out how politicized and racialized uh, the, uh, the way that we define and collect data on crime. Um, and, and the criminalization of Black conduct coming out of, um, uh, you know, Reconstruction after, after, you know, the 13th Amendment, um, and, and the way that municipalities um, collected information about 
who was committing crime and what conduct was considered criminal has always been tied uh, to, to race um, and lack of privilege, a uh, lack of privilege. And so um, it, it's, I find it really problematic uh, to point to you know, crime rates and um, without interrogating that history. Um, and so I'm so glad um, uh, that you brought up exactly the points uh, that you did, but I, I, I wanted to underscore how important it is to look at this long arc, this long history of um, how problematic uh, sort of what we define as, as criminal is. Um, and um, in terms of, you know, I think a lot too about um, uh, what would offer a pathway toward repair um, of, of harm and, um, and not even just repair, but to create a forum in which someone who's experienced a harm uh, can be in perhaps a literal conversation with a person um, uh, or maybe more of a metaphorical sort of in conversation with someone who has enacted harm. Um, and, you know, Jocelyn mentioned that I had started out as a uh, capital defense appellate attorney. So I was working on um, cases where the prosecution had occurred 20, 30 years prior. Um, my client was sentenced to death and we were navigating the post-conviction process. Um, and in that context, I was introduced to what was so novel to me. I was de defense initiated victim outreach, which is a sort of a form of restorative justice, uh, but created a forum for, for the survivors of the murdered victim uh, to perhaps be in conversation, ask questions of my client um, and to create uh, sort of a pathway for that conversation to happen. Um, we often contracted with a third party so it wasn't you know, me as, as the defense attorney or even investigators I was working with, uh, but we, we contacted someone who had this kind of training to reach out to the victims, uh, loved ones, um, and family members to invite them to make contact if they wanted. And the potential for some sort of, I don't want to call it restoration, how do you return back to um, uh, you know, before your loved one was murdered? Um, how do you return back you know, to um, whatever pre sort of harm? It's, it's not necessarily restoration, but there, it's, it's something that our adversarial criminal legal system doesn't offer. And so to the extent that we can create, replace the system we have now with something that looks more like that, uh, to me is incredibly exciting. Um, and Sujatha Bolingo, who's on your coast, uh, you know, is deeply engaged in this work. Um, Common Justice, so I know it's come up here, is, is based right in Brooklyn, uh, is doing this kind of work. Um, what's unfortunate about it is it often exists in the shadow of litigation, so it's not really replacing. Um, you know, if things, if things don't work out, then you're still gonna be uh, prosecuted and incarcerated. Um, but the, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, the students <laughs> that are on the call, that are in our classes, that are in your class, Professor Claire, um, are, are thinking about how it is that they can incorporate this. And prosecutors really do hold a lot of power in this arena uh, to allow these sort of conversations to happen before trial. So not 20, 30 years down the line. Um, and so I think about the ability for prosecutors, as you mentioned, Professor Claire to shrink their power, but to also use their discretion, not just to, um, you know, not prosecute at the top possible offense, but then to think about um, something that doesn't involve prosecution um, and doesn't exist just parallel to the threat of prosecution and incarceration. I'm going to try to take another sort of few ideas from all the really generative comments that I'm seeing. Um, and uh, that's about thinking about education, about law schools and future lawyers, but also in generally about educating each other. So the broad question would be, how can we take ideas from your book and communicate them toward the goal of abolition to those who might be resistant to systemic change for any number of reasons? That's kind of a broad question. And then there's a couple of questions about law schools and um, Professor Claire, you really do sound like you ha have gone to law school with the, your intricate knowledge of, of, of uh, process, but you didn't. And so, you know, I think you provide great perspective for us as legal educators um, or future lawyers about um, how to train each other and talk to each other. I know I'm constantly in the process of learning, um, you know, so there's a question um, how pedagogy or community building in law schools can change to address power imbalances between 
people who we represent um, and, and law students or lawyers. Um, and there's also a question about whether greater opportunities for law students to interact with people who've been directly impacted by the criminal legal system um, during their legal education might be beneficial to developing a foundation for forming better attorney client relationships. And I wanted to bring these questions together because I think they're related. The how can we take your ideas from this book and translate them? And these great suggestions in the question about pedagogy of either community building or you know, this more targeted question, it's not just building community with people who are directly impacted, um, but turning over some power and turning over some leadership in how we learn and think. And you can tell from the way I phrase the questions that my, my answer to those questions are yes, yes, all of those things, those things you said, we need to do them. Um, I know that you know in at, at Brooklyn, the Center for Criminal Justice has been trying to uh, make videos and have conversations with people who've been directly impacted, pay them for their wisdom and labor and have those uh, voices heard in the classroom. But that's just one small thing. I think this question about not just listening to people who are directly impacted, not just going to sit in courtrooms, but by the way, everyone here should do those things. Um, um, but um, there's another step of trying to uh, be in community with others, trying to build uh, coalitions, that not just of ideas, but about like people together, either virtually or physically, um, trying to communally think of a different world that, that we can get to. So I'm both asking and answering the questions. And I could say a lot more about this, but I'm curious um, to hear your reactions. So I'll briefly answer, and then I'm curious to hear more of both of your reactions. Um, but, you know, I luckily uh, got an advanced reader copy of uh, Derricka Purnell's new uh, book that's coming out in October called uh, Becoming Abolitionist. Highly recommend this book. I think it's really fantastic on this question, too, because she takes us in a beautifully non judgmental way through the path and journey of how she became a police abolitionist. Um, and I think like many of us, and you were sort of saying this earlier, you know, we, and both of you, you sort of came into law school and as lawyers, like, you know, clearly caring about injustice and inequality, but maybe not quite where a lot of law school students are today, or at least many progressive law school students are here today. And I think hearing and watching and learning about in the book about her sort of you know, different studies and struggles with, you know, Robin D.G. Kelly and other people who came in and spoke to her sort of collective of law school students and, and thought through sort of like, uh, what does it mean to maroon and be, you know, based on sort of like marooning, you know, the maroons who are sort of uh, people uh, who were resisting slavery. Um, it, what does it mean to do that in, in this moment, in this contemporary moment when we're uh, not seeking to abolish slavery, but seeking to abolish uh, the prison industrial complex? And so I think uh, co-creation, uh, listening, um, being in community with recognizing that a lot of experimentation is happening already before our eyes and learning from people who are doing things already on the ground who maybe aren't uh, necessarily people that you hear about every day in the news or whatever, uh, but it's happening in your local community and being in community with those people and talking to them and learning from them. And then with respect to the book, I think one thing that I have found useful is often people who read the book, although this is not by any means, uh, everyone. And hopefully when the book comes out in paperback, this book can go on the inside in jails and, and prisons. Um, I've had conversations with people uh, who, who have hoped that it could, but it's a hard, it's paper, it's hardback right now. But anyway, I think a lot of people who read the book are privileged. They're you know, people who have high educations, maybe they've never been arrested in their lives. And so I think reading chapter uh, three, uh, which is about sort of the privilege experience, uh, really sheds light and is something that really uh, resonates with people and they realize just how uh, many ways the system advantages them and allows them to escape various forms of punishment. But I think moving a step further for privileged people, and I, I really draw sort of thinking about Paul Butler's uh, thinking here, I think we need to recognize that abolition to some extent is happening also in pockets of affluence where What's occurring is there are a lot of social supports, 
There's a lot of things to do to prevent harm and prevent people who are harming from going into the system, such as a lack of police surveillance or families covering things up, right? And a lot of people have chosen, as Paul Butler says, to do nothing rather than to draw on and rely on the criminal legal system. And so, of course, that's an indictment on the legal system ever affording, or people thinking that the legal system could ever afford them justice. But I also think it's a statement that this is not gonna like radically make it so that crime rates suddenly spike up. Uh, you know, I think we, we really need to understand that abolition, first of all, it's a gradual process, but also it requires replacement of a punitive way of dealing with harm to sort of exactly as Professor Hogg said, uh, you know, in, in uh, Khalil Gibran Muhammad's work to a social support way of dealing with harm, which we've done historically, and we can do it again today. It's just that we have chosen not to do it for poor people of color. Yeah, I don't want to add much to that because uh, we could end right there. But this idea of, you know, when defund the police was attacked by uh, both the right and the left, um, the, the, the second part of it was left off, which is to then uh, replace, reinvest in non-punitive systems and non-punitive solutions. Um, and as, as you lay out, um, Professor Claire, this exists in other communities uh, that are rich in resources um, and are not over-policed um, and the sky hasn't fallen there. Um, and so I, I am hopeful uh, that the brilliant students uh, that are on this call are going to be part of this wave of change uh, because they are thinking way ahead of us. And I know they're thinking way ahead of us in Palo Alto as well. Um, but I am, I am heartened and I am encouraged um, and I'm grateful uh, for your contribution uh, to this work and these thoughts through this book. Um, and all of the writing I know you're, you're continuing to do. So, so thank you for bringing your wisdom virtually to Brooklyn. Yes, likewise. Thank you so much to Professor Claire for joining us. Thank you to everyone in the audience who stayed this whole time. For those of you who are Brooklyn Law students, and I know that's a fair number of you, um, let's be in community and keep talking about all of this. I'm ready to read chapter three with you or any of the chapters. Just let me know. We'll be in the courtyard. But uh, for those of you, no matter what community you're in, um, let's build community together. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Professor Hogue. Thank you, Professor Claire. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye bye. <laughs>